All right. Now, um, in Numbers chapter 13 here, we see the story where basically, you know, the children of Israel were, this is shortly after they, they've been uh, led away from Egypt, right? Moses led them out of Egypt. You know, all the plagues happened to Pharaoh. Moses leading them out. You know, the, the, um, they cross the Red Sea. They go, they go out of the land of Egypt. And now they're traveling through the wilderness and trying to make it into the promised land, the, the land that God had promised them, the land of Canaan here. And God tells Moses, he says, okay, I want you to take 12 men, one for each of the tribes of Israel, and send them out and spy out the land. And just, just search it out. You know, you're going to figure out, you know, make your plan of attack and everything else. You're going to see, look at the land, and you're going to see the land that God has, has promised to them. So he does it, he picks out 12 people, they go out, they search out the land, they find, they find this great cluster of grapes, and they bring that back, they bring back some figs, and they say in, um, in verse number 27, it says, We came unto the land, whither thou sentest us, and they told him and said, We came unto the land, whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. And they bring back the fruit, and they show, look, look, it's a great land, right? They say there's all this great stuff there, it's flowing with milk and honey, it's very prosperous, but there's these giants there, right? There's these men there are, are great. Now, one of the things that well, I'm going to be preaching on mostly tonight are these giants, okay? And there's a lot of false doctrine surrounding giants. There's a lot of people that will ridicule you and make fun of you and say, oh, yeah, you believe that there were giants in the earth and all this other stuff. We're going to, we're going to deal with that. Now, we're going to see what the Bible talks about giants. And um, for the first place for that, keep your finger in Numbers 13, if you will, because we're going to flip over, we're going to come right back to Numbers 13. Flip back to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6 is the first um, mention that we get of giants. It's right in the front of the Bible. It talks about giants right away. I mean, within the first six chapters of the, of the Bible, all of a sudden we start reading about giants. Okay. Genesis chapter 6, verse number 1, it says, And it came to pass... When men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit should not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be in 120 years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the earth, for it repenteth me that I have made them. So here's our first introduction to giants. And right off the bat, there's a lot of people out there that, that believe weird, false, strange doctrines about giants and where they came from. And I'll just tell you a little bit about what, about what they believe, um, just so you understand why I'm even going into this. There's a lot of people out there that think that when it says, look at verse number two, it says that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. There's, there's a... a large group of people out there that believe that when it says the sons of God, it's talking about angels. And they think that the angels came and they had this relationship with, with human women and because of that, that's where these giants came from. And that, and that was the result of, of the angels seed with, with the human seed and they produced these, these great you know, giants as men. And that is patently false and we can prove that from the Bible. Now, the Bible says that the sons of God saw the daughters of men. All throughout the Bible, you will never find a reference to the sons of God being anything other than a, than a man or a human being. Just as the same way today that we are children of God, when you put your faith in Christ, you become a son of God. And John 1 says, And to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Um, all throughout the Bible, you see that that believers are considered sons of God, never are you going to find a reference to an angel being a son of God. Actually, to the contrary, in Hebrews chapter 1, 
Verse number five, the Bible says, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. The Bible does not refer to angels as being God's sons or being God's children. And so when it says here that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that's talking about, you know, saved people, the sons of God, going out to the heathen and, and the unbelievers and taking unto them wives of the daughters of men. That's all it's referring to. They took them wives of all which they chose. And then verse number three says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his day shall be 120 years. Then it says in verse four, there were giants in the earth in those days. So they say, see, look, after verse number two, it says the sons of God saw the daughters of men. They were fair and they took them wives. And then in verse number four, it says there were giants in the earth in those days. But keep reading verse four. It says there were giants in the earth in those days. So first it says there's giants in the earth in those days. Then it says, and also after that, after what? After that, there were giants in those days when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children of them. The same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. It's separating, distinguishing the fact. It's like God knew that this false doctrine was going to come out and he already satisfied an answer to that. Even if you wanted to say that the sons of God were not men, even if you wanted to say, you say okay, fine. You want to say that they're angels? They're angels. Verse 4 still says that the giants were in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. They became mighty. It doesn't say that they were giants. It just says that they were mighty men, men of renown. And you might wonder, like, why are you even going into this? Because there's people that believe this crazy doctrine and it's out there and, it's, and I don't want you to be deceived by it. But because the thing is, giants are not, the, the sons of God, sorry, excuse me, the sons of God are not angels. And we could further prove that in, um, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 7, the Bible says, And of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. The Bible calls angels spirits. Okay, spirits do not have a physical relationship with a woman. And, and produce children. That's just not the way that spirits work. You have to have flesh in order to have fleshly seed in order to do that. But they'll just say, oh no, look, the angels came down and the, the fallen angels, these devils, had, had some kind of relationship with these women. It's nonsense. It makes no sense. It contradicts the Bible. Also in Hebrews 1.13, it says, but to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. Angels are spirits. They're not flesh. They're not blood. They're not given in marriage. The Bible says in, um, in Matthew 22, verse 29, it says, Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err not knowing the Scriptures. And that these people that believe this false doctrine, they err because they don't know the Scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. The angels don't marry. They're not given in marriage. They don't have children. They don't, they don't have this type of physical relationship. They're spirits. They're, they're spirits that are ministering spirits meant to help and to minister unto, unto, unto God's children. The sons of God, who are you if you're a believer in Christ? But these people just want to say, no, 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 it's angels. That's where giants came from. It's false. Okay? The Bible doesn't say anything about that. It just says that there were giants in the earth in those days. And then you even see, too, it, it doesn't make any sense because if you continue reading in Genesis 6, verse 5, it says, And God saw the wicked, that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Man became wicked. It doesn't say anything about the angels becoming wicked or the devils or fallen angels. It's talking about man becoming wicked. Verse 6 says, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. That means he was grieved. It grieved him at his heart. God was upset that he even created man. And then in verse 7 it says, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the earth, for it repenteth me that I have made them. If all this resulted from angels fornicating with women, then why is God so angry at men to destroy men and, and the rest of his creation? It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't follow that these giants came from the seed of, of, of angels. 
It just it just makes no sense because then God would God be upset with them, you know, and destroy them instead of being upset with man. And of course, after this comes the flood, and um, God does destroy men from off the face of the earth because they had become wicked. And I believe it starts with them, you know, looking at at unsaved women and, and taking them to wife, and the women turn their hearts away from God, and they became more wicked. And um, but I'm not going to get too far into that. I kind of want to cover that a little bit since most of the sermons going to be dealing with giants. That, um, that we just have that clarification that the, that the giants... Look, the giants existed. Giants were just big people. Well, how big were they? Right? You say, well... Because there's also there's other stuff on the internet. People show these pictures. And they'll be like, look, look, this is a picture of a giant. And it's like this massive, like, you know, 100 foot tall thing or whatever. Like some extremely tall picture of like... You know, they'll show like some big leg bone. And it's like five times the size of a man sitting next to it. And it's just supposed to be like the portion from their foot to their knee or some, you know, some ridiculous amount like that. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 3.11, it says, For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of the giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. So his bed was made of iron, right? Is it not in Rabbath of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it after the cubit of a man. You say, well, that's great, but what's a cubit? The cubit is the length from your arm to your fingertips. It's approximately a foot and a half. That's kind of the average, the general um, length of a cubit. So you say, okay, well, if his bed was nine cubits long, that's about 13 and a half feet. Okay, that's, that's, that's a big bed. That's pretty tall. Now, I don't know about you, but my bed is a little bit bigger than I am, right? So 13 and a half foot bed, he probably didn't have his feet hanging over the edge. He was probably had it something that fit him. And, um, and four cubits wide is about six feet. I measured my bed, my king size bed, which fits me, six foot two inch man. My king bed is roughly seven foot by six feet wide, okay? So his bed would be about 13 and a half feet by six feet wide. And of course my bed is built for two people his bed might have been built for one. So if you look at these figures, a giant is probably approximately about twice the size of your average man. Right? I mean, his bed is about twice the size of my bed. So it just, it just seems the reason that a giant would be, you know, taller, 10, 11, 12 feet tall maybe. Right? Um, which, when you think about that term, yeah, that's tall. You'd call someone a giant. But we have, I mean, there have been people that are extremely tall, even living today. I mean, you have eight, nine, and I don't know what the Guinness Book of World Records tallest man is that they have on record, probably like nine feet or something, or ten feet. I mean, you got guys playing basketball that are really tall. So when people ridicule and say, oh, you believe they're giants? They weren't that, I mean, it's not that far out of the realm of, of possibilities, thinking like, yeah, there's no way there could have been giants when they're, you know, maybe 10, 11 12 feet tall. I mean, of course that's tall. That's big. That's a, that's a big man. But is it really outside of the scope of, of reality when you got people even today growing to be nine feet tall? I don't, I don't think so. I don't think it's that hard to believe. But the Bible tells us that's what it's talking about when it's talking about a giant. We have, this, we have a couple of, of measurements. We're going to get to the other one later. We see Iraq, the king of Bashan, though he was, he, was the rem, he was the last that remained of the remnant of the giants. And that was back in Deuteronomy chapter number 3. But now let's look at this story in, in Numbers 13. Let's flip back to Numbers, if you would. Because the, the sermon's not just, you know, I want to I kind of help you understand what is a giant, where do they come from, and, and, you know, how big are we talking here? So we can get a better understanding of what's going on in this story. So Moses sends these men out, the, the leaders of each of the tribes. They go out, they check out the land, they come back, and they say, yeah, you know, the land is really good. But there's a problem. Because the problem is that there's these giants in the city. In, um, in verse number 28, or it says in verse number 27, it says, And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great, and moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, 
Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. So Caleb's saying, look, they're bringing up this report, and they're saying, you know, the people are strong, the cities are walled, this is just going to be too difficult, we can't handle this, there's giants there. And Caleb's saying, no, 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 he's like, look, we can do this. We, can, we are well able to overcome it, he said. And, but verse number 31 says, but the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. Stature means that they're really tall, right? They're giants. I mean, they're, they're 10, 11, 12 feet tall. tall. And it says, And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. So now they're kind of exaggerating a little bit when they say that we were in their own sight as grasshoppers. And I think this is where a lot of the, the, the false images come out. People say, oh yeah, giants were, you know, like a hundred feet tall because they're trying to use, they'll take this one verse and they'll try to take this one out of context when you actually have clear measurements in other parts of the Bible that tell you how big his bed was. And they'll say, oh, well, if they were like grasshoppers, then that must mean, you know, the ratio between a man and a grasshopper is this much. And they'll try to tell you that these giants were just, just extremely, extremely tall. You can't just take one verse out of this. They were just making this description. They were exaggerating and saying, look, they're really big and we're little. We're like grasshoppers to them. That's all they're saying. But, um, but this is their scare. You know, they're scared. They're kind of losing their faith in God because here's a, you know, God promised them this land. God brought them out of Egypt and they knew this. I mean, this is the whole deal. They knew that they were going to go in and, and inherit this promised land and God was going to lead them to this land and he's going to give it to them. So they, and they seen all these miracles already. This is the same generation of people that saw all the plagues in Egypt. They saw the lice. They saw the frogs. They saw the water turn into blood. They saw the hail. They saw the darkness. They saw the firstborn child being dead and all the other plagues that came with it before they came out. They saw the sea being stood up on both ends and they crossed through on dry land. They saw the sea come back down on the chariots and the, and the army of Egypt that were chasing after them. They saw all these things. They saw the water come out of the rock in the wilderness. They saw God provide all of the sustenance for them. They've seen all of these things that God has done for them, yet they still have this doubt. They still got scared when confronted with this seemingly, you know, unsurmountable obstacle. These, these, these large, strong people, walled cities, well-defensed, they just... They just didn't think they could do it. They were in their flesh. They were thinking that there's no way we could possibly overcome this people. They lose their faith. faith. Sorry, look at, look at chapter 14. It continues on with this story, Numbers 14. Look at verse number 2, and it says, And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? So now... Look at, the, look at what happens. It's gone from bad to worse. First they come back and they're just like, we can't do this. The result of them losing their faith, not trusting in God's promises, not believing in God's promises, that God's actually going to fulfill his end of the deal and give him the land that he promised them. Now all of a sudden they've turned and they've flipped on Moses and Aaron. Now they're saying, they're murmuring against them, right? They're calling their, their authority into question. They're saying... Would God that we had died in Egypt. Now say it would be better for us to have died in Egypt or to die in the wilderness, but you've brought us in here, it says in verse 3, and wherefore hath the Lord brought us into unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey. Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? It amazes me every single time I read this, and I say this probably every time I preach on it, it amazes me that these people, they were in bondage in Egypt. They were slaves. They were being whipped and beaten and they were being forced to do all this hard labor and, and the work was getting harder and harder. The, you know, Pharaoh was making them kill their, their, their children that were men. He was telling the midwives to kill them when they, when they gave birth to sons. 
They had the, the law. That's why Moses was sent down the river in a basket when they couldn't hide him anymore because Pharaoh said that you had to kill all the male ch children. This is the type of, of tyranny and bondage that they were in in Egypt. And now they're saying just because these guys are big, just because they look strong, they haven't even gone to fight with them yet. They're just saying it would be better for us to go back to Egypt. It would be better if we just never left Egypt. And it blows my mind to think that they have this type of an attitude. We're not better for us to return into Egypt. When, when they know that they came out of that, how quickly they forget how bad they actually had it. And they can look at, look, they brought back the fruit of the land. They said, look, this fruit is great. It's flowing with milk and honey. It is everything that God said it would be. But there was an obstacle. And they didn't, they decided not to put their faith in God, not to trust that he was able to complete that promise. Even though it looked like it was impossible. Even though they felt like, hey, there's no way we can do this because they're thinking about it in terms of the flesh, not in terms of God actually giving it to them. They're relying on themselves to do it. And yeah, if they're going to rely on themselves, they can't do it. There's no way they could have beat the giants. That's why it has to be of God. And that's why God gets all the credit and, and, and honor for these battles when he brings his people through because he's always looking to, to use people and use the underdog and use the people who have no chance in the world. So that way it's without a doubt God gets the glory. God gets the respect. God gets the, the credit for the victory because he's the one that actually brings the victory. Look at verse number four. It says, and they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return in Egypt. So now they're looking, they're going to be done with Moses. They're going to be done with Aaron. And they're saying, let's just go back into Egypt. Now, Joshua and Caleb were two of the men that, that were chosen to go spy out the land. Remember, we already saw that Caleb said that, um, no, no, no. He's like, look, let's, we can do this. You know, let, let's go in and do it. We're well able to do it. Now they had faith. Look at verse number seven. It says, And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord. Neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. So they're preaching to people saying, look, if God delights in us, and if God's promised us, look, the land is great. He's saying God is going gonna, is gonna to deliver them into our hand. He said, look, their defenses are going to be like nothing. If God is with us, then there's no way that they're going to be able to stand. And they're just basically trying to tell them, look, don't rebel against God because God's the one that commanded them to go into this land. God's the one that's telling them to go and do this. They're saying, look, if you don't do this, you're rebelling against the Lord. Don't fear the people of the land. He says they're bred for us, their defenses apart from them. Fear them not. But verse number 10, look at how they respond to this. It says, but all the congregation bad stone them with stones. Not only are they not going to listen to them, but they're saying, yeah, we just need to kill these guys. That's how much they're despising the Lord and despising what the God has, has wanted for them. They've gone now. See, it started off with them just getting scared. It started off with them seeing the people of the land and getting, oh man, I don't think we could do this. And how quickly they turned to, well, now we just, you know, maybe we should just come up with a new leader. Let's, let's not follow Moses. And now they're willing to kill these guys and stone them with stones that are preaching that, no, just obey God and just follow him. Uh, let's continue on there. Verse number 10, it says, And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. So God sees what's going on here. And when it says the glory of the Lord, that means his brightness. And glory is like a shining, it's a brightness. The glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle. So they had this the tabernacle of the congregation. Is, um, and you can read about that in Exodus, where God gave them all the instructions on how it was supposed to be. It's basically a big tent. And it's the tabernacle for God where they kept the ark and uh, the mercy seat and all these different things were um, uh, not, not all this, uh, some of the stuff was in the temple but any, regardless, okay, he made this tabernacle and God was in there and he would fill up the, the tabernacle with his glory when God was among them it would just shine real bright and the people knew that God was there and it says, and the Lord said, in verse number 11, and the Lord said unto Moses how long will this people provoke me and how long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I have showed among them, I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them and will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. So he's telling Moses, yeah, he goes to Moses and he says, look, how 
long are these, are these people just going to resist me? They're going to provoke me into anger. They're not going to believe me. I've shown them all these miracles. When is it enough? He said, I'm just going to destroy them, and I'm going to make of you a, a, a great nation. He said, I'm just going to be done with them. Moses, you're my servant. I'm just going to wipe them out, and I'm going to make a, a mighty nation of you. And Moses intercedes for them, and he prays the guys, look, God, like, don't do this. Don't, you know, don't kill them. Then everyone else is going to see it, and they're going to think that because you're not able to bring them into this land, that's why they, that's why they died. And he's, he's, he's interceding for the people, which is what a great, meek, humble man he was, that even though that these men were looking to stone them and kill him, he still loved them enough to save them from God's wrath. He stepped in. God was willing to wipe them out and be done with them. Even though they wanted to kill Moses, Moses still said, no, just, 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 let's do this, God. Don't, don't, you know, people are going to see this and not going to like it. He still had a heart that loved people, even though they hated him. But let's jump down here to verse number 22. Because God ends up judging their lack of faith. So he doesn't wipe them out completely. But what he does something else, it says in verse 22, Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers. Neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land whereunto he went, and his seed shall possess it. So he's saying, look, all those people that are saying, you, we can't do this, and they want to go back in Egypt and everything else, he said, they're not going to go into the land. He said, they will not see that promise land because they didn't believe me. And that's, this is the point where they end up just having to wander in the wilderness for 40 years until that whole generation dies, but their children then are able to go in and inherit the land because God's had enough of them. He said, okay, you're not, going to get in, you're not going to make it into the promised land. And again, another picture of salvation, right? The promised land would picture heaven. And because they don't believe God, they don't have faith in God, they don't make it into heaven. They don't make it into the promised land, which is exactly the way it is for us. If you don't have your faith in God, if you don't put your faith in Christ, you're not going to make it to heaven. You're not going to make it into the promised land. Now, Jump down, if you would, to, to Numbers 14, verse number 39. Because, and this is going to be one of my first main points. We're, we're going through a lot here with this, with this battle. But what I kind of want to point out is what, what we have to do when we're faced with giants. Okay, and I'm not talking about the physical, literal giants that they were faced with. But you have to have God with you. We see what happens, because the people get upset. Ultimately, then, the people are, are upset, and they think, man... Okay, you're right. When they, when they hear God speaking and they hear all this stuff, they say, you know what? Okay, we're going to go and do this now. Now we've changed our mind. After they've already lost their faith, after they're ready to stone them with stones, look at verse 39, it says, And Moses told these sayings unto all the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly. So they're really upset. Verse 40, And they rose up early in the morning and got them up into the top of the mountain, saying, Lo, we be here, and we'll go up unto the place which the Lord has promised, for we have sinned. So they say, okay, now we're ready. Look, we sinned. Now we're going to do it. Now we're ready to do it. So they go up in the mountain. And Moses said, verse 41, Wherefore now do ye transgress the commandment of the Lord? But it shall not prosper. He said, look, now you're breaking the commandment of the Lord again. Because he said, you're not going to go. And I'm not going to be with you. So he said, look, it's too late. You had your chance. You could have done it. Now it's too late. Now you can't go up against him. God's not with you. You're going to go up and try to fight this battle. You're going to fail. Verse number 42, it says, Go not up, for the Lord is not among you, that ye be not smitten before your enemies. He's warning. He said, Look, you're going to get killed. God is not with you. Don't go and do it. But again, they have this, this stiff neck. Look at verse 43. It says, For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and ye shall fall by the sword, because ye turned away from the Lord. Therefore, the Lord will not be with you. And again, something to remember in your own life. If you decide to turn away from the Lord, now it doesn't mean that he's going to take your salvation away, but God's not going to be with you. See, God has angels. God's able to protect you. God's able to, to make sure that bad things don't happen to you. But if you decide to just turn away from God, you want to have nothing to do with what he says, you hear his commandments, and you're like, I'm not going to do that. Do you think God's really just going to, going to be 
wanting to just keep his protection with you and, 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 not ma and make sure that no bad things are going to happen to you or whatever it is and deliver you out of problems. No, he's going to let you go right through those problems. You, oh, you're you're going to turn your back on me? Fine. Go ahead. See what it's like on your own. See what it's like without me being with you. And this is what they do. Verse 44, it says, But they presumed to go up unto the hilltop. Nevertheless, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. So they just presumptuously just went up and said, oh, yeah, yeah, whatever. We're just going to go and do it anyways because that's what God told us to do. And they're just still not listening to God. They're not listening to what Moses is telling them from God. Verse 45, it says, Then the Amalekites came down and the Canaanites, which dwelt in that hill, and smote them and discomfited them even unto Hormah. So they just lose. They lose this battle. They, 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 just, they get turned away. They get slaughtered and they lose the battle because God's not with them. <clears throat> Turn, if you would, to 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're going to see the story of David and Goliath. So one of the important things to take from this is that if you're going to be facing giants, you need to have God with you. Right? God needs to be with you in order to, to, to get success in this type of a battle. 1 Samuel 17, we, we see a great story of David, real popular story, David and Goliath. First Samuel chapter number 17. I'll give you a minute to get there. First Samuel 17, we're going to look at verse number 4. It says, And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. So here we get another measurement. Here's a giant, it's Goliath, right? Goliath is a giant. It says he's six cubits and a span tall. That's approximately ten and a half feet. We don't have exact measurements on this because, you know, a cubit and a span were measured using, like, you know, a man's hand or whatever. So um, it's around ten and a half feet tall. So Goliath is about ten and a half feet tall. That's pretty tall. But we have this measurement. Again, another place we have a measurement. Verse number five. First Samuel 17, five says... And he had an helmet of brass upon his head. And he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And one bearing a shield went before him. So we get here kind of an idea. He's got all this armor. Right? I mean, he's ten and a half feet tall. He's a warrior. You bet he's built. He's strong. He's got all this, this, this armor on. He's got this huge spear. And, you know, he says it's like a weaver's beam. I don't know exactly what a weaver's beam is, but a beam is probably pretty big. Right? Um, he's got this large weapon, the big shield, a coat of mail, you know, all kinds of armor, greaves. It says, And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. So he's, he's coming out. You got these two... Just to, just to put this, this um, scenario in, in, in a picture here, you got these two armies. you got the army of Israel and the army of the Philistines. And there's a, there's a valley in between them. They're encamped along on each side of this valley. And every day that Goliath is coming out, and he's kind of he's stepping out in front of everyone and saying, Come fight with me. I defy you. Send a man to fight with me. Bring him out here. He's like, we don't even need to let our entire armies fight in battle. He said, let's just settle it with one-on-one. -on -one. Send, what your, send your best guy out to me. He says, if he kills me, hey, we'll be your servants. You win. But if I kill him, then, then we'll be your servants. So he's issuing this challenge. He's coming out. He's intimidating. I mean, he's ten and a half feet tall or whatever. Giant guy, big man of war, and, and everyone else is scared. The children of Israel are scared. No, but they're not sending out a guy to fight with them. They're just thinking like, oh man, you know, we don't want to have anything to do with this guy. And every day they're kind of at a standstill. They're in camp against each other. They're not really fighting. But this guy's getting up every day and just, and just issuing this challenge. And he's saying, I defy the armies. Like, Come on, send somebody to me. I'll kill you. Everyone was afraid of Goliath. Then David shows up. Jump down to verse 26. See, David shows up. 
he was sent by his father to bring food unto his brothers because his brothers were in the army. And um, he was there. He's going to see how things are going. And then he, when he shows up, he sees Goliath. So he sees him issuing this challenge. And in, in, in his reaction here, we find in verse 26, it says, And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? So David's got a different attitude than everybody else. He's saying, who is this guy? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Who is this heathen that's standing here and defying the armies of the living God? He said, God is with our armies. God is with our people. Who is this guy that's going to defy the armies of the living God? And he's asking, he said, what's going to be done to him? See, David had courage. He had boldness. He had confidence in God. He had faith that God was with them and God was there to deliver them. That even though you have this guy who seems to be someone that there's no way you can defeat in battle. You look at him and say, there's absolutely no way I can beat this guy. There's no way. No physical human way I can do it. He's way too strong. He's way too powerful. He's got this armor. How in the world am I going to attack that guy and kill that guy and prevail against that guy? Well, you can't. But God can, and if God is with you, he can. And David had this type of confidence in God. He was prepared for this battle, and we see that here. Because he had been in difficult situations in the past. We see him, you know, he's, he's going around, and he's, talk, and he's talking tough. And he's saying, look, who is this guy? So the word gets around to King Saul. Jump down to verse 32. Saul hears about this, about David, about David talking this way. He wants to talk to him. He says, and David said to Saul, let no man's heart fall fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. He said, I'll go fight with him. Verse 33, And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. He's saying, this guy is, is trained and learned to war ever since he was a kid. Okay? This guy is strong. He said, you are, he said, you're just a youth. You know, you're, you're just a young guy. Like, like, there's no way you can fight this guy. He's a trained warrior from his youth. Verse 34 says, And David said unto Saul, he gives him this story, right? This is something that happened to David. He said, Thy servant kept his father's sheep. He was a shepherd. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. So he's saying, look, I can take this guy. I was out watching the sheep. He said a lion and a bear came out, took one of the sheep. He said, I took him by the beard. I killed him. I killed the lion and I killed the bear. Basically, he's like, I killed him with my bare hands. Now that's pretty tough. That's a, that's a pretty significant feat to say I killed a lion and a bear. Right, just by yourself. It's not like he had a gun and he shot at him. He's like, he, he went up to him and he grabbed him by the beard and he killed him. But look at this. And he said, this guy who's defying the armies of the living God, yeah, he's just going to be like the lion and the bear. Look at verse 37. So David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion. So who's he giving credit to? His own might and his own strength? No, he's saying the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion. God was with me. God delivered me from that lion. He said, and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, go, and the Lord be with thee. So he wins over Saul's confidence with that because Saul was a man of God too, especially in his early times. Now he ended up turning away from God and he faced a lot of penalties for that. But, it, but up to this time, hey, Saul was right with God. He, he believed in God. And he, you know, he heard David saying, he said, okay, fine. You know, if God's going to be with you, go on, go and do this. And, and David, see, David has this great heart. He has an excellent spirit, an excellent heart. He believed, he gave God all the credit. That's where the credit was due. Because God's the one that delivered him out of the, out of the hand of the lion and the bear. And he said, and he was fully confident. He said, you know what? God's with me and God's going to deliver this Philistine into my hand as well. Look at verse 38. It says, and Saul armed David with his armor. And he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also, he armed him with a coat of mail. And it says, um, And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them up for him. So Saul's like, okay, we're going to get you ready for battle. 
Because David just showed up. He wasn't there ready to fight. He wasn't there for anything. He was there to go bring food to his brothers and see how things went when he saw Goliath and all this other stuff. And he's saying, look, why, why are we letting this guy scare us? God's with us. Let's, let's take this guy out. So Saul wants to get him ready. The best way that he knows how, he's giving him armor, he's giving him a helmet, you know, a full coat of mail, all this stuff. And David's like, no, look. He's like, I haven't proved these. You know, I, I, I don't, I'm not, I haven't used this. You know, it's not something that he's comfortable with. It's not something he's used to wearing that stuff. He's like, I don't need this stuff. It's just going to hinder me. It's not something that he's proved and he's used to and he's, and, and he's worn and, and he knows it's going to work and he kind of knows how it's going to work with him. He said, I don't need this. And he takes them off from him. And in verse 40, it says, and he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook. So he goes to the brook, he takes five stones and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a scrip, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. So David's coming out against this Philistine. And this, the Philistine had another man that was, that was his armor bearer that was bearing a shield before him. Right? I mean, he had like this other guy that was there to, to help um, protect him and deflect any, any blows from someone that would come against him. So a shield bearer went, goes before him, verse 42, And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance, which means like, you know, I mean, David's a young guy, he's ruddy, he's, he's got this fair countenance. You know, warriors typically had scars and, and, and battle wounds and all this other stuff, and you can tell that they were warriors. David's this guy, I mean, he's a pretty good-looking guy, he doesn't have any blemishes and stuff, and he comes out there, and he's a young guy, and he disdains him, he looks at him, he's just like, this is who you're sending against me? Look at verse 43, it says, And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog, that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his God. So he curses David, he's like, look, you're insulting me. You're going to send this little boy out to, to battle against me? And, you know, this is the way he's viewing David. Verse 44, And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the fields. I'm just going to kill you. The birds are going to eat you. Verse 45, Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. So he's saying, look, you can come to me with your sword. You can come to me with your shield. You can come to me with your spear. But I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord. You've defied God, the God of Israel, and I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Verse 46, This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. So all of this time, see, his brothers thought, we didn't read that part. His brothers were thinking, oh, what are you doing here? You know, like, this doesn't concern you. Get out of here. You know, you're just causing trouble. What, you know, thinking that, like, maybe he's there to just get his own honor and get his own glory and stuff, and he wants to make a name for himself. And that's not it at all. He's like, isn't there a cause? Look, he's going here this whole time, this whole battle. It's clear. David is completely relying on God. That's what he tells Saul. That's what he tells Saul about his story. He's giving God the credit. And even when he confronts the Philistine, he's saying, look, God's going to deliver me, deliver you into my hand. I'm going to take your head off of you this day because you've defied God. You've defied the God of Israel. And then he says, this is going to happen that all the earth may know that there's a God in Israel. To give God the glory. That's why he did this. That's why he had the confidence. And that's why he was going up to fight a battle that would be seemingly impossible. That there's no human way. I mean, if you had Vegas putting odds out on this fight, on this death match between David and Goliath, I mean, it would be like a million to one. Like, there's no way. They would be that, that, that long shot, right? Nobody would want to take that bet because you look at Goliath. He was this 10 and a half foot tall guy, a warrior, completely equipped. And you have this other guy. He's got a sling. He doesn't even have any armor on. And he's going up to fight, to fight this warrior. You think the guy is nuts. But let's see what happens. Now, we know what happens. We know the story. It's a popular story. But let's just read what it says here. And um, in verse 47, And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you in our hands. Again, he's making it clear. He's saying, look, God doesn't need a sword. God doesn't need a spear. God doesn't need any of this stuff. God will make a way to deliver you into my hand without any of those things. 
You can trust in your spear. You can trust in your sword, into your flesh, and how strong you are. You can, you can trust in all that, and it's going to kill you. I'm trusting in the Lord. The battle belongs to God. Verse 48 says, And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Again, the boldness that David had. I mean, he had not one shred of fear. Look what it says. He hasted and ran. So the Philistines coming out. They're about ready to fight. What does David do? He just starts taking off running at him. Not one shred of fear. No doubt. No hesitation. He sees this man. God's with me. God's going to take you, you know, take your head from off your shoulders. And he just runs at him. No fear. It's amazing. I mean, think about Put yourself in that situation. I mean, anyone here could probably figure that you might be that day. You're going out with no armor. I mean, this guy's got this big old spear. He could probably stab you before you even come within, like, many feet of him, right? And he's got this big spear, and, and, he, and he's this big, muscular, your strong guy. How are you going to defeat this guy? David ran at him. He ran right into it. It says in verse 49, And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. So he hit some right square in the forehead. I mean, perfect shot, right? He just got this thing. He's got this thing. He's got the rock and single. Hits him square in the forehead. Falls down to the earth. It says in verse 50, So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone. What warrior is going to go out to battle just with a sling and a stone? No arm or nothing else. He goes out with a sling and a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. David didn't even have a sword. That's all he had because he had that much faith in God that God was going to deliver him into his hand. And God did so. God gave him that victory. It's not because David was so skilled with that sling that he was a crack shot and there's no way that he was going to miss. He wasn't trusting in his own ability. He was running at him. And I would imagine, I mean, I know even shooting guns or shooting bows or anything like that, if you want to be able to aim and do something accurately, you're going to stop and stand still. He was running at him and just went, Phew. God, God made that happen. God gets the victory. It says, verse 51, since he didn't have a sword, it says, therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. So he runs up after, after Goliath falls down on the ground. He stands up on him. He pulls the sword out of the sheath, cuts off his head. Everyone else turns to flight. Everyone else runs to flight. I mean, this is their top guy. This is a guy, I mean, if you're going to have confidence in any man, they have confidence in this guy. No one was pulling him back and saying, hey, don't, don't issue that challenge. I think they might be able to beat you. So like, no way, let's do it. You know, send out your best guy. They had confidence in this guy. When they saw that he just fell down flat dead, and, and David was already telling him it's of God, they just turn around and run away. Now, it's kind of a fun story. I, I love the story of David and Goliath. I think I know my kids love hearing about the giants, and, and it's kind of an interesting thing. You don't hear that much about giants, but there's a whole other application that I was kind of alluding to in, in, when we were going through a lot of Bible verses. And what I really want you to take away from this sermon, if nothing else, I mean, you learned a little bit about giants, but how is this going to help you, right? Facing a giant is not something that happened very often in the Bible, right? It might be a once-in-a-lifetime event, if that. David faced Goliath. This was a big event. Now, you might have a Goliath in your life, in your lifetime, a big, massive, seemingly insurmountable obstacle. Something that may be looking at you harm, something that you look at and say, there is absolutely no way I can deal with this. This is impossible. I can't do it. That might come upon you someday. And, and it might be in you know, a personal relationship. It might come who knows what. You might get to a point where you're so low and you're just thinking, like, I, I can't do this. I can't even breathe. I cannot get past this. That Goliath may come and face you. How are you going to handle it? Are you going to get scared? You notice what we saw, what happened in Numbers 13 when they got scared. When they saw John, they got scared. They doubted God. They didn't have their faith in God. And then that, that quickly turned into 
than being against God and against the people of God and, and ready to stone God's people and, um, and willing to just go back into bondage and go back into sin and go back into Egypt. And that ultimately ended up with them wandering around in the wilderness and dying because they lost their faith in God. And that's, and that's you know, that fear, not having that confidence in God is, is, is going to only hurt you in your life. When you're, when you're confronted with, with this, with whatever it is, some major event that happens in your life, this big Goliath, and you think there's no way I can deal with this, you have to maintain your faith in God. See, God is able to deliver us out of any situation. The moment, and we're, we're seeing this when we go through the book of Acts. You see time and time again where God steps in. Impossible scenarios. I mean, when, when, when the apostles are put into prison, and they're shackled, their hands and their feet, and they're between guards, God comes and, and, and breaks them out, and they go walking out of the prison. God's able to do that. God is able to do anything. These events really happen. Make sure you understand that God is real. This event with Goliath, David and Goliath, Goliath was a real man. He was a giant. He was about ten and a half feet tall, like the Bible says. He had all this armor. He was big. He was strong. And a young, ruddy man of a fair countenance killed him with a sling and a stone because God was with him. He had total faith and confidence and trust in the Lord. When these events happen, make sure that you're prepared for the battle. Make sure that, that God is with you. I mean, that's the, the, the most important thing that we can have in our life is having God on our side. No matter what you have to face, I don't care what it is, if God is with you, the Bible says, if God be for us, who can be against us? If God's on your side, you have nothing to worry about. But you want to make sure that God is on your side. Make sure that you're in your Bible. Make sure that you're living the way He wants you to live. Make sure that you're going to have God with you and backing you up. Make sure that you're not just, just turning your neck against God and, and, just, and just walking away from Him and not hearing what He has for you to do with your life. If you're, if you're doing way, what He wants you to do, if you're disobeying God, God, will be, God is fully capable of protecting you. The Bible says in Philippians 4.13, it says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthen me. All things. Now, that time may come and it, and it might seem humanly impossible. And those, those are the best times for God. God wants to show His strength through weakness, through the weakness of man. God said He's going to use people with a, you know, with a stuttering mouth and, and um, I, don't, I don't have the verse memorized, but with, a, with another tongue and with stammering lips, he's going to use people like that to preach the gospel and get them saved and do this, this mighty work. People who aren't that good. He's not going to use the people as much that have all the best abilities and talents and things like that. He likes finding the weak people. He likes finding the small people. When he chose the people of Israel, they were like the smallest people in, in the earth. He just found the, 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 the lowest amount so that he can make his name great. He likes receiving that praise. He likes receiving that honor. When you take someone as, as small, little, and young as David against the giant, God gets the glory for that because there's no way he can do it on his own. And if you're going to go out and you're going to face these battles on your own and just trust in yourself and trust in how strong you are and how good you are and how well-equipped you are, hey, the Bible says safety is of the Lord. I'm not going to trust you know, in my guns and in my dogs and everything else to protect me from evil. Now, I'm not saying those are bad things to have. But ultimately, you need to have your faith in God and your confidence in God. Because all of those things, if God's against you, none of those things are going to help you. Not one. But if God is for you, you don't need any of those things at all. Because God will find a way to, to strengthen you and to make sure that you can come through unscathed. So, kind of a fun sermon. I enjoy, I enjoy, I enjoyed reading about the giants and, and kind of learning about them. But, but make the application in your life. Whenever that happens, have your strength, have your, your confidence in the Lord. Don't lose your faith. Because that's, the first, that's what Satan's going to want to do. He, he's going to try to present you a thing. And just, I'm going to close with this. Satan is a deceiver. We know that. We're not ignorant of his devices. 
Satan is a con man, and he tries to make, for one thing he tries to do, he tries to make sin look way better than it is. He tries to trick you into thinking, oh man, you really got to get in here. Look, you see the billboards for the alcohol, right? It's got these women, these people, you know, playing volleyball and having a good time, and everything's just fun and great. That's not the end of alcohol by any means. It's a trick. It's a deceit. That's not how it really is. When you go out and get drunk, and it's not like that at all. You end up just saying stupid things, and you end up just thinking perverted thoughts. That's what alcohol is really like. But they're not going to show you that on the billboard. Satan's not going to try to advertise it that way. He's going to trick you. Now, the same way that he does that with sin, he's going to take events in your life, and he's going to try to magnify them and make them look and appear a lot bigger than you. He wants you to fail. He wants you to lose your faith in God. He might take an event and try to blow it up into something that you think you just can't handle this. Don't lose your faith in God. Don't let the devil win and, and, and make you lose your faith in what he is able to do for you because God is able to do anything. Anything. Don't ever get this bad attitude against God and start questioning, well, God, why are you letting me go through this? All this other stuff. Look, God knows what's best for you and God is able to deliver you out of the hands of the enemy and no matter how big the obstacle is, God can get you through it. If you're facing addiction, if you're facing any, whatever the problem is that just seems like you can't deal with it on your own, trust in the Lord. God can help you get through it. You have to have that confidence of faith though. Don't lose your faith in God and He'll be there for you. And Let's uh, bow our heads and word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity to preach. God, um, things don't always come out the same way as, as I envision sometimes when I'm when I'm preparing sermons, dear Lord, but I pray that you would please just uh, help us all to leave with, with something, with some kind of edification and um, and a little bit more faith in you maybe, just just knowing how powerful you are, that even though we can't necessarily see you or, or um, it's, not a, it's not a physical thing that's proven with our eyes, that we will still have the faith, knowing, especially reading these stories and these events, God, that, um, that you are fully capable of, of, of being with us and protecting us. God, help us never to lose our faith in you. Help us to, um, to make, be diligent of staying as close to you as possible by, by heeding your commandments and listening to what you'd have us to do. And um, that we wouldn't be, be bad children, dear Lord, but that we would be sons of God that, can, that, can, um, that you would look down on and not be ashamed of, dear Lord, and that you would be more than happy to use us and to use us through our weaknesses to, to make great victories against the giants that come up in our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.